Hello everyone, and welcome to my The Young and the Restless official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Danny and Christine started making love in their hotel suite at the athletic club. Phyllis pulled the fire alarm in the hallway and ran out of sight. Danny wished to ensure that they had a long life together, but Christine surmised that it might be a false alarm. They hastily put on a half-dress and dashed outside. As guests exited the club, Phyllis was waiting at the bottom of the steps. When she saw Danny and Christine, she said the alarm had gone off because she had just been getting some orange juice and coffee. Phyllis saw that the pair were disheveled and pretended to be sympathetic, explaining that they had been involved in some sort of incident. Phyllis's finger was bleeding, and Christine couldn't help but wonder how she cut herself over a glass of orange juice. Christine wondered aloud if the alarm had been set off intentionally. Phyllis wondered who would take such an action. Christine pictured it as a highly troubled individual who didn't give a damn about delaying rescue efforts. While Christine surmised that a poor, insecure woman had grabbed the alarm and injured her finger, Phyllis surmised that the device had malfunctioned. Phyllis, according to Christine, couldn't bear the idea of Christine and Danny being together. Phyllis lied, saying that the only reason she was aware they had been upstairs was because they had arrived looking messy and half-naked. Christine remembered how Phyllis had made fun of her earlier, saying that she was depressed and alone since Danny had turned her down. Christine disclosed that Danny had extended an invitation for her to accompany him on his tour. Christine guessed that after learning that she and Danny were together, Phyllis had followed her upstairs, listened at the door, and gone insane. Phyllis growled that Danny's interest in someone like Christine was the only thing that was strange. Pulling a fire alarm was a felony, according to Christine, and Phyllis was still on probation. Christine imagined herself looking for fingerprints or blood traces on the alarm, but Phyllis shot back, saying Christine wasn't the DA no longer. Christine contended that as a concerned citizen, she could still report the incident. Danny asked Phyllis to get over her obsession with him and move on, declaring that nobody would be phoning the police. Victoriously, Christine looked back at Phyllis as Danny brought her upstairs. Danny relit the candles in their hotel suite, while Christine went on and on about how Phyllis had set off the alarm to trick them. Even if Phyllis had done it, Danny reasoned, it had been a foolish move that had failed, and he proposed that he and Christine continue where they had left off. He put the music back on and made a light-hearted remark about how much clothing Christine was wearing. She started unbuttoning her blouse. Danny traced the words, I love you on Christine's bare back and covered her with flower petals after they had sex. In bed, she rolled over and confessed her love for him. They shared a kiss. Phyllis made the announcement at the athletic club bar that it was never too early to sip champagne and that she was happy to announce that she was removing Danny Romolotti from her life. Phyllis complained bitterly that Danny had no taste in women and questioned why he would want to take the bug on tour with him when he had the opportunity to have Phyllis. She could not care less what they did, so she determined to put her life back on track and eliminate them from her life. Audra asked Sally if she wanted to have some company at society. Sally said she was waiting for Adam, but she was happy to have Audra come along to avoid having to read an article about some other people's extremely successful design firm. Audra said Sally could use someone to ramp to in return and invited her to do so. Sally guessed that things with Tucker weren't any better. Audra stated that she had attempted to follow Sally's guidance and defend their relationship, but she had come to the conclusion that it wasn't worth preserving. Perhaps it had felt like love, Audra surmised, but it had really been foolishness. Sally remembered that Audra had insisted on feeling something for Tucker and their special bond. It didn't mean it was healthy, Audra lamented. Tucker, according to Audra, had claimed he loved her and that she was the one, but he was unable to let go of Ashley because she was always there. Audra disclosed that she had threatened to leave if Tucker didn't cut Ashley off. She said he'd made the ridiculous accusation Ashley was having mental health problems. Ashley was one of the most self-assured and steady persons in town, Sally complained. 
Audra surmised that either Tucker had made it up as a justification to stay in Ashley's life, or Ashley was making it up to get Tucker back. Audra proclaimed that she was done with Tucker because she couldn't bear to keep putting herself through it. Sally asked about the follow-up meeting with the OCD specialist when Adam later joined her. Adam stated that Connor was having emotional difficulties regarding his diagnosis and available treatments. Adam went on to say that although his son had begged him to come home, he didn't think it would last long if Chelsea and Dr. Alcott had their way. Adam revealed, heartbroken, that Connor had declared he detested himself. Sally proposed that they go somewhere more quiet so they can talk. Adam revealed to Sally in her hotel room that Dr. Alcott had suggested Connor attend a residential treatment facility. Sally thought that Connor needed a dedicated area to receive targeted assistance. Adam lamented that Connor had asked Adam not to force him to go because he had difficulty adjusting to new environments and wanted nothing to do with it. Connor had adapted to his new school and was liking it, Sally noted. Adam revealed that Connor had gone through more than he and Chelsea had thought. Adam clarified that Connor had both good and poor numbers, and that Connor was afraid of some of them. Sally mentioned that the facility might be able to assist Connor, pointing out that she could image it being tiresome to be continuously calculating to make sure the numbers didn't cause trouble. Adam went into detail about how the exposure and preventive therapy was meant to elicit anxiety in patients and provide them with coaching so they wouldn't react with obsessive behaviors. Adam was worried that it would merely exacerbate Connor's anxieties and make things worse, but Sally felt it sounded promising. Adam stated that Chelsea had been prepared to send their son go that day, and she was upset that he had decided to bring Connor home. Adam thought the doctor and Chelsea were working together to force the idea through. Given that the choice and the label would affect Connor for the rest of his life, he questioned if it would be wise to wait and seek a second opinion. Adam wondered why his desire to ensure they were doing morally made him the adversary. Sally reassured him that with Connor's safety in jeopardy, applying the brakes made sense. Chelsea was completely on board with what the doctor wanted to do, Adam moaned, and she wanted to implement the plan right away. Adam struggled with how quickly things were going and remembered Connor calling himself insane and the dejected expression in his son's eyes. Sally realized that Adam was having difficulty accepting the truth about Connor's illness, which made him hesitant to commit to a plan. Adam shared that he had discovered that Connor may feel as though his life was in jeopardy in ordinary circumstances when his fear was aroused. Adam reflected on how he had been unaware that his intelligent, compassionate boy, who still had his entire life ahead of him, had been experiencing that type of suffering. Adam was hugged by Sally, who comforted him and told him not to punish himself for feeling something about Connor's condition. Adam considered the possibility that if he had been around more, none of it would have happened, but Sally ordered him to stop. Adam wished he had greater assurance in his decision-making. Sally told him to concentrate just on getting Connor through it, not how it affected him. Jack went downstairs at the Abbott Mansion and saw Ashley, dressed in sweats and pigtails, eating popcorn, listening to music on her tablet, and giggling. She took off her headphones and asked, How you doing? She said, I'm binge-watching season three, and he said he didn't realize she had that much spare time. He screamed her name loudly. Joking that it kept her out of trouble, Ashley offered to pause the broadcast so he could have a conversation with her about business or something. It wasn't like Ashley to watch sitcoms in the living room on a binge, Jack noted. Who says? Was her reply. Jack added that Billy had mentioned that when he'd run into Ashley at society, she hadn't seemed like herself. Ashley countered that she had chosen to unwind at home by watching the show, and she recommended that Jack give it a shot since it was less expensive than the alcohol he consumed. She bemoaned the way her family was always criticizing her. She asked with a testy grin, What do you all want from me, anyway? Ashley complained that she had gone through a difficult period with Tucker and apologized if her viewing of a sitcom upset Jack. Although Jack acknowledged that she was free to do whatever it took to divert her attention from Tucker, he thought this was an unpredictable method. When Ashley said she wanted a vacay, Jack suggested she take Tracy to a sunny beach. 
Ashley walked out after haughtily clarifying that she wanted a holiday apart from her family. Her own voice warned her that she was creating suspicions and insisted that she wasn't healthy or powerful enough. Her mood abruptly altered as the speaker insisted she relinquish control. Tressie entered the room to look for Ashley, while Jack cleaned up the mess Ashley had left behind. Jack revealed that their sister had stormed out when he saw her giggling like a teenager and watching a sitcom on her tablet. Tracy reasoned that it was preferable to Ashley's recent prickly demeanor, but Jack wondered if Ashley had ever been known to binge-watch anything. People needed escape, Tracy reasoned, but Jack was concerned Ashley's entire manner had become unstable. Though Ashley claimed to have moved past the situation, Tracy questioned whether she was still healing from what had happened with Tucker. After dressing more elegantly, Ashley watched from the steps as Jack and Tracy talked about how hard it was for Ashley to admit that her confrontation with Tucker had been violent after all. Ashley gave them the finger for not stopping their psychoanalytic analysis of her. Ashley pronounced Paris riddle solved and chastised her siblings for discussing Tucker more than she did. Ashley said she was ready to move on, but the two of them were secretly talking about getting Ashley committed so they could watch a sitcom. If it seemed like they had been hovering, Tracy apologized, but she didn't think Ashley could hold them responsible. Ashley spit out that she did hold them responsible because she was ready to move on. She yelled, so, back the hell off and let me, as she walked away over Jack's objections. Jack wondered if it was time to give up and allow Ashley to have her own way. Tracy believed that would be a grave error. At this point, Jack wasn't sure what more he could do for Ashley. When he asked how she was doing, he was guaranteed a lecture or a tantrum. Tracy thought Ashley's demeanor stemmed from her profound sense of humiliation, stemming from her sense of their judgment beneath the surface. Ashley had seemed so confident about herself, Jack reflected. Tracy had observed Ashley intently, and something seemed strange, so she wouldn't let it go. Tracy revealed that she had a strong gut feeling that this went beyond Ashley's fixation with Tucker. Tucker was on the Crimson Lights Terrace, leaving a message for Ashley. Presuming that she had been receiving his messages, he recounted how, just hours after ordering him to forget everything, she had sent him a text message announcing that everything was forgiven and that she wanted to continue where they had left off. He insisted on seeing her face to face because he had a suspicion that something wasn't right with her. He asked her to give him a call back. Audra stepped into the coffee shop patio, but as soon as she saw Tucker, she turned around. She thought she made herself very plain, but he stopped her and reminded her that she'd never replied him about Glissade. Tucker insisted that his feelings for Audra were unrelated to what was happening with Ashley. Tucker urged her not to let anything stand in the way of their business, insisting that they had to manage it. Given that they couldn't even resolve their differences, Audra had doubts about their ability to collaborate. In Ashley's most recent disgusting attempt at seduction, Audra acknowledged that she felt manipulated and angry and said that she was done fighting for Tucker. While Audra argued that Ashley was playing him, Tucker conceded that Ashley was ill, even though Audra wouldn't give a damn, if Ashley were a delicate flower experiencing a mental breakdown, she clarified that Ashley wasn't. Even if Ashley needed assistance, Audra contended, Tucker wanted to save her, and that wasn't good for Audra. I'm out romantically, professionally, completely. Is that clear enough for you? Audra responded. Tucker insisted that his relationship with Audra was as genuine as it got, but he still owed Ashley his assistance. Tucker clarified that although he wasn't in love with Ashley, he still cared about her and always would. Tucker doubted that Audra would ever cease loving Noah, and he believed she couldn't expect him to suddenly lose all affection for Ashley after such a long time of being a significant part of his life. He promised to spend every waking moment trying to mend things with Audra and to do whatever it took to help Ashley. Tucker pleaded with Audra not to let it ruin her career. Angry, Audra questioned Tucker's belief that she couldn't achieve without him. Tucker encouraged her to consider the opportunity she would be passing up, even though he knew she could. Audra retorted that she didn't care if it was a mistake anymore and that she believed removing herself from him was one of the best decisions she had ever made. 
Nate went to grab her arm, but she pushed him away and screamed, Don't touch me. You heard the lady, Nate forewarned Tucker. Tucker commanded Nate to quit bothering Audra, and Nate in turn told Tucker to mind his own business. They went to the counter after Audra requested Nate to purchase her a cup of coffee. Ashley asked Tucker to meet her a society of a text message. Audra thanked Nate inside the coffee shop for helping with Tucker. Nate restated that he continued to be confused about her relationship status with Tucker. While Audra would not discuss specifics, she gave Nate her word that she was done with Tucker completely. Nate surmised that she was unemployed once more and inquired about her plan B. She replied that she had none, but being a survivor gave her confidence that she would manage. Ashley apologized to Tucker at society for her prolonged absence. He questioned what forget the whole thing had meant, to which she flirtatiously vowed she wasn't playing hard to get. Tucker pointed out that Ashley had been erratic in her behavior, and Ashley labeled it a foolish error. He hoped she would let him know that she was merely playing a retaliation game so that he could put her out of his mind and go on. From the adorable tiny furrow on his brow, she deduced that he was in love with her as she took the olive out of her martini. Tucker acknowledged his feelings for Ashley, but after all the games she'd been playing, he couldn't use the word love. What more could she do to persuade him that her affections for him weren't a game? She inquired. Tucker realized that everything that had happened had affected them both, and he believed it had affected her mental state because she appeared to be on the verge of collapse. She drooled, the edge of something wonderful, and begged him to jump with her. His reply was straightforward. He wanted her to consult a psychologist. She chuckled. If Ashley was okay, Tucker volunteered to go with her and eat crow. If not for him, he pleaded with her to do it for herself. The idea that Tucker felt she required a therapist was condescending to Ashley. She stated that she had confided in a psychiatrist acquaintance in Paris, and he had concluded that she was completely normal. Tucker questioned whether her recollection of her conversation with the therapist was as distinct as the one from her altercation with him. Ashley believed they had moved on, referring to what had transpired in the café as an isolated incident. Tucker pushed to find out what visiting an impartial person in Geno City would cost her. Resuming her martini, Ashley chirped that her friend's analysis had satisfied her. Tucker didn't give up until she met another expert, figuring her friend had probably given her the information she'd needed to hear. So what do you guys think about this update? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like my videos, please press like and subscribe for more. I'll see you guys next time.